Good afternoon. Welcome to this broadcast of the National Assembly Proceedings on this 7th day of April 2022. This is the last session of the 12th Parliament. The broadcast is brought to you by the Parliamentary Broadcasting Unit in conjunction with the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. It is a special day in the life of Parliament, in the life of Parliamentary Broadcast, uh, because this afternoon, uh, pursuant to the provisions of Standing Order 244C, the uh, Speaker will today, not later, later than 3 p.m., invite the Cabinet Secretary for the National Treasury and Planning to make a public pronouncement on the budget highlights and revenue-raising measures for the national governments for the financial year 2022-2023. Um, according to the provisions of the standing order 244C, the cabinet secretary responsible for finance shall make a public pronouncement of the budget policy highlights and revenue raising measures for the national government as contemplated under the Public Finance Management Act. The speaker may designate a suitable place in the chamber for the purposes of admitting the cabinet secretary to make the public pronouncement on the budget policy highlights and revenue raising measures. The public pronouncement under paragraph one shall be heard without question or clarification. On the same date that the budget policy highlights and revenue raising measures are pronounced, the cabinet secretary shall submit to the National Assembly a legislative proposal setting out the revenue raising measures for the national government together with a policy statement expounding on those measures. The provisions of the National Assembly Powers and Privileges Act Cap 6 shall apply to a cabinet secretary admitted to the chamber under this part. If you're just joining us, the members of parliament are uh, slowly making their way into the chambers. It is an important day for uh, the National Assembly and Parliament in general. Uh, normally, this exercise would have happened a little bit later, but due to uh, the reasons that uh, all Kenyans are aware of, um, the, it has been made necessary to have this exercise uh, delivered today. Um, but there are other businesses that uh, the members will be getting into before the Cabinet Secretary for Treasury is allowed into the Chamber to um, present the budget. The member for Emuhaya constituency, Honorable Mboko Milemba, will ask the Cabinet Secretary for Transport Infrastructure, Housing, Urban Development and Public Works. Uh, what urgent measures has the Ministry put in place to ensure that um, some roads within the constituency are improved to motorable standards considering that the, uh, the, some of these roads were blocked during the recent renovation and construction of the Kisumu Butere railway line. And when will the ministry provide suitable railway crossings at uh, Ebukolo, um, Ebusioya, and Asikate areas in Emuhaya constituency to allow free movement of people and goods, considering that major economic activities take place around these areas and in particular Luanda town. And also could the cabinet secretary consider employing local residents, particularly the youth uh, from uh, uh, Ebu Sikwe area of Emuhaya constituency during the construction, maintenance and other works with respect to the railway line. The question by the honorable member for Emuhaya constituency will be replied to before the departmental committee on transport, public works and housing. The member for Motate constituency, Honorable Andrew Modime, will ask the Cabinet Secretary for Energy to provide details on the status of the electricity connectivity, if any, to public schools, health facilities, households, and other public utilities in Motate constituency, and also what measures uh, the Ministry has put in place to ensure that all public schools, health facilities, households, and other public utilities in Motate constituency are connected to the national grid. The question by the Honorable Member for Motate constituency will be replied to before the Departmental Committee on Energy. 
the member for Kinango constituency, Honorable Benjamin Dalu Tayari, will ask the Cabinet Secretary for Interior and Coordination of National Government to indicate the public participation will be undertaken with regard to the boundaries of the newly created Samburu and Kinango sub counties in Kinango constituency, Kwale County. And could the Cabinet Secretary explain why the newly gazetted Samburu sub county? was not designated as a recruitment center in the just concluded 2022 police recruitment exercise. The Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable Justin Muturi, has walked into the chambers and uh, this be a very special afternoon for the National Assembly. Um, we do invite you to follow this live broadcast on the go on YouTube and also on KBC Channel 1 as well as Bunga TV. My name is Edward Kabasa. Enjoy your viewing. Let us pray. Almighty God, who in your wisdom and goodness have appointed the office of leaders and parliaments for the welfare of society and the just government of the people, we beseech you to behold with your abundant favor as your servants whom you've been pleased to call to the performance of important trust in this republic. Let your blessings descend upon us here assembled and grant that we treat and consider all matters that shall come at our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to promote your honor and glory and to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of our country and of those whose interests we commit into our charge. Amen. Order number one, administration of oath. Order number two, communication from the chair. Come later. Order number three, messages. Order number four, petitions. Order number five, papers. Leader of the majority. Yes, thank you. Honorable Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers on the table of the House today, Thursday, April the 7th, 2022. Number one, the budget estimates for the financial year 2022-23 from the National Treasury that includes the following. One, uh, financial year 2022-2023 program-based budget. Number two, financial year 2022-23 Estimates of recurrent expenditure, volumes one and two. Uh, number C, financial year 2022-2023, estimates of development expenditure being volumes one, two, and three. And D, financial year 2022-2023, list of projects. But E, the budget summary for the fiscal year 2022-2023. F, the estimates of revenue, grants, and loans for the financial year 2022-2023 budget. And G, the financial statements for the financial year 2022-2023 budget. Number two is the estimates of recurrent and development expenditure of Parliament for the financial year 2022-2023 and projection for the financial year 2023-2024 to 2025 by the Parliamentary Service Commission. And lastly, the budget estimates for the judiciary by the chief register of the judiciary were laid on the table of the House on Tuesday, February the 1st, 2022. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I beg to lay the papers. The Chairman of uh, the Committee on Delegated and Legislation, Honorable Kamket. Mm. 
Mr. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to lay the following paper on the table of the House today, Thursday, 7th, April 7, 2022. Report of the Committee on Delegated Legislation on its consideration of the traffic, uh, driving schools, driving instructors, and driving licenses rules 2020, legal notice number 28 of 2020. I thank you. Very well. Next order. Order number six, notices of motion. Order number seven, questions and statements. First segment uh, on questions. First question is by the member for Emoya, the Honorable Omboko Milemba. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I rise to ask question number 103 of 2022 to the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure, Housing, Urban Development, and Public Works. Number one, what urgent measures has the Ministry put in place to ensure that the Busioya Mungoe Road in Ipali location and the Bukoro Kwachi Frabor Road at the Bukoro Railway Crossing and Asikote Muraka Mwichehe Road at Asikote Railway Crossing in Mohaya constituency are improved to motorable standards considering that the three feeder roads were blocked during the recent renovation and construction of the Kisumbu Railway, railway Line. Number two, Honorable Speaker, when will the Ministry provide suitable railway crossings at Ebukolo, Ebsioya, and Asikote areas in the Mohaya constituency to allow free movement of people and goods considering that major economic activities take place around these areas and in particular Luanda town? And thirdly, Honorable Speaker, could the Cabinet Secretary consider employing local residents, particularly youths from Ebsiekwe area, in a Mohaya constituency during construction, maintenance, and other works with respect to railway line. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. The question will be replied to before the Departmental Committee on Transport, Public Works, and Housing. The next question is by the member for Matate, Yama Mwadime. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Honorable Speaker. I raise to us question 104 of 2022 to the Cabinet Secretary for Energy. Subsection 1, could the Cabinet Secretary provide details on the status of electricity connectivity, if any, to public schools, health facilities, households, and other public utilities in Matate constituency? Subsection 2, what measures the Ministry has put in place to ensure that all public schools, health facilities, households, and other public utilities in Matate constituency are connected to the national grid? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question will be replying to before the same, co uh, the, sorry, before the Committee on Energy, Departmental Committee on Energy. The last question is by the member for Kinango, the Honorable Benjamin Dalu Tayari. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to ask question 105 of 2022, directed to the Cabinet Secretary for Interior and Coordination of National Government. Roman 1, could the Cabinet Secretary state and indicate when public participation will be undertaken with regard to boundaries of the newly created Samburu and Kinango sub-counties in Kinango constituency in Kuala County? Roman 2, could the Cabinet Secretary explain why the newly gazetted Samburu sub-county was not designated as a recruitment center in the just concluded 2022 police recruitment exercise. Roman three, what measures is the ministry taking to ensure that the said administrative unit is adequately staffed, including ensuring that administrators are recruited to facilitate service delivery? I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well. The next segment is uh, request for statements. We start with the first by the member for Garissa Township. Hon. 
Honorable Speaker, pursuant to the provisions of Standing Order 442C, I rise to request for a statement from the chairperson of the Departmental Committee on Finance and National Planning relating to the exercise of delegated authority by the Cabinet Secretary for National Treasury. Honorable Speaker, Section 4 of the Tax Appeal Tribunal Act No. 40 of 2013 was amended by this House through the Tax Appeal Tribunal Amendment Act No. 7 of 2022, and it came into force on 21st of March 2022 after the President assented to that law. <clears throat> Previously, Mr. Speaker, Section 4 of the Tax Appeal Tribunal Act No. 40 of 2013 conferred upon the Cabinet Secretary for National Treasury for all matters relating to finance with the authority to appoint members of the Tax Tribunal. However, Mr. Speaker, following the amendment of Section 4 done by this House, it now provides that the Judicial Service Commission under the leadership of the Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya has the sole responsibility to appoint the members of the Tax Appeals Tribunal. Honorable Speaker, despite the provisions of the law being amended to provide for otherwise, the Cabinet Secretary for the National Treasury, Wan Ukuriatani, on the 25th of March 2022, this year, irregularly appointed members to the Tax Appeals Tribunal for a period of three years, effective 15th of April 2022, through a Gazette Notice number 3647, published in the Kenya Gazette of 1st of April 2022. Honorable Speaker, it's on this basis that I seek for a statement from the Chairperson of the Departmental Committee on Finance and National Planning to inquire into the matter that I have raised herein, and in particular, which powers does the Minister has in exercising delegated authority in the light of the requirements of Section 4 of the Tax Appeals Tribunal Act No. 40 of 2013 as amended, and Mr. Speaker, further, whether the Cabinet Secretary is in a position legally to usurp the powers of the Chief Justice and the Chair of the Judicial Service Commission as per the amended Section 4 of the Tax Appeals Tribunal Amendment Act No. 7 of 2022. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is the Chair of Finance in the House? The Chairperson or the Vice Chair, the Honorable Dirangwa Yenya? Uh, uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We will be in a position to answer that question next week about uh, whether the minister has made it to appoint uh, officials of the Tax Appeals Tribunal. We are also alive to the fact that we passed that law here recently and it was accented to by the President. We will find out and report to the House next week, Mr. Speaker. You know, save for the fact that um, the Honorable Duale has sought a statement, if it was a question, remember our standing order number 42B, subsection 2, close O. A member is not supposed to ask uh, a question uh, about matters which can be found in ordinary materials of reference or which, which are otherwise obvious to the member, especially like uh, what is in law, because law, law is published. 
So maybe the committee will merely, and I don't think whether even by, if, assuming that's what the cabinet secretary has done, he has not used up the powers of the chief justice. The amendment we effected was to give that authority to the Judicial Service Commission. You know, it, it, I chair the Parliamentary Service Commission, and if something is done against well, the addition of the commission or power of the commission, it's not about me. So, so I think um, the, it is important that uh, the committee will look and see whether it is indeed that's what has happened and make its report to the House and recommend appropriate action because uh, it is expected that um, everybody knows the law and that law could not have been passed without the involvement of the National Treasury. And maybe, in fact, the Honorable Dwelle would, would remember that indeed that, uh, that amendment was necessitated by a decision of the of the court. So that remember previously, the Attorney General's Office and other functionaries were in the habit of appointing um, members of the political parties dispute tribunal. Because political parties uh, thought they should be the ones to appoint who are the people to go and resolve their disputes. But after that decision, that, that power was, was given to the Judicial Service Commission. So similarly, the National Treasury should uh, just let go. Uh, you know, al allow the JSC to appoint persons uh, suitably qualified to perform the duties of, um, of that tribunal. So, Honorable Ayenya, just make sure that you get, the, get, get everything that revolves around uh, that appointment. There's a statement to be made by the Honorable Dr. Otiendi Amolo, member for Rarienda. If it may please, the Honorable Speaker, I rise to make a statement, pass one to standing order number 43, on the 12th ordinary session of the Plenary Assembly of the Forum of Parliaments of the International Conference on the Great Lakes Region, held between 2nd to 6th April 2022 in Nairobi, Kenya. Honorable Speaker, I rise pass one to standing order number 43 to make this statement on an issue of general topical concern namely the proceedings of the 12th ordinary session of the plenary assembly of the FPICGLR that took place from 2nd to 6th April 2022 in Nairobi, Kenya. Honorable Speaker, as you may be aware, the Forum of Parliamentarians of Member States of the International Conference on the Great Lakes Region is an interparliamentary organization of 12 parliaments of Member States of the International Conference on the Great Lakes Region, namely Republic of Angola, the Republic of Burundi, the Central African Republic, the Republic of Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Republic of Kenya, the Republic of Rwanda, the Republic of Sudan, the Republic of South Sudan, the United Republic of Tanzania, and the Republic of Uganda, and also the Republic of Zambia. Of the forum's organs, the plenary assembly is the highest decision-making body and is mandated to, inter alia, approve the nomination of office bearers of the FPICGLR, adopt the forum's budget, adopt the reports of committees, adopt the recommendations and resolutions to governments and parli parliaments of member states, and to deliberate on all matters within the jurisdiction of the forum. The plenary assembly meets on an annual basis, and the venue of the event is held on a rotational basis between member states. Honorable Speaker, the theme for this year's event was the role of parliament in conflict resolution. Since its establishment, the forum has been crucial in spearheading discourse on security, peace, stability, and development in the region, a region that has over the years seen more than its fair share of bloody wars, famine, starvation, economic and social inequalities, as well as religious strife and political instability. The last five years have been a learning experience for all member states. Members were fully exposed to and briefed on governance issues in the region. The threat and impact of insecurity was clearly enumerated and elaborated with members' understanding of conflict being greatly enhanced. The forum received a presentation by Professor Yasin Olum, PhD, a Fulbright scholar on the role of parliament in conflict resolution. 
which revealed without doubt that parliaments have a fundamental role of preempting and preventing conflicts, including upholding the rule of law, addressing post-conflict recovery, engaging in constructive partnerships and cooperation, and reconciliation. Member States appreciated efforts by the Forum in undertaking fact-finding missions, which had assisted countries such as the Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, and the Republic of South Sudan in finding solutions and peaceful settlement to political instability. The Forum looks forward to future engagements with the parties involved to address outstanding issues for lasting peace. The Forum also pledged support in efforts to resolve the ongoing conflict in the Republic of Sudan. It was also resolved that parliaments must, more, must be more assertive in addressing the root causes of instability. The President of the Forum, who is also the Speaker of the Senate, the Right Honorable Kenneth Lusaka, urged member parliaments to, quote, move from talking to acting, close of quote. Honorable Speaker, in his opening address delivered by the Cabinet Secretary for Interior and Coordination of National Government, His Excellency President Uhuru Mugai Kenyatta, CGH, challenged member states on a five-point question framework for reflection and action on the way forward, namely, one, is the role of parliament preventive or responsive? Two, at what stage in the conflict circle should parliament intervene? Three, to what extent should parliament's intervention role be exercised? Four, which collegiate and peer review mechanism should parliaments adopt in supporting and holding each other accountable? And lastly, how can parliaments inculcate public participation of stakeholders in our built-in shared bonds into this conflict prevention and conflict resolution framework. We therefore must emphasize that parliament and parliamentarians are important conduit for strengthening governance systems and enhancing democratic ideals. Honorable Speaker, the parliament of Kenya was represented at the plenary by the following members. One, the Speaker of the Senate, the Right Honorable Kenneth Lusaka. Two, the this, this Senator Samuel Pugisio, who is also the President of the Executive Committee. Three, Senator Sylvia Kasanga, who sits in the Committee on Women, Children, Vulnerable Persons. Four, Honorable William Kanket, who sits in the Committee of Humanitarian and Social Issues. Five, Honorable Godfrey Muturi Kingangi, who is a member of the Committee on Peace and Security. And lastly, the Honorable Speaker, uh, you are truly speaking, who sits in the Committee on Democracy and Good Governance. Honorable Speaker, at the close of the five-day event yesterday, the Forum adopted the Nairobi Declaration, which read as follows. One, it calls for strengthening of efforts by ICGLR member states and other stakeholders towards diplomatic and peace-building peace measures aimed at resolving conflicts in the Great Lakes region. Two, calls for member states to ensure that all the conflicts in the region are resolved peacefully and they will work tirelessly towards implementing the objectives of the peace security and cooperation framework in order to attain stability and development. Three, calls for political leaders at national, regional, and international level to support mechanisms aimed at resolving conflicts which have adverse global impact on economies. Four, calls for commitments from governments as well as regional and international actors to work towards uh, reducing the proliferation of small arms and to improve natural resource management to curb the incessant conflicts. And lastly, calls for the ICGLR member parliaments to strengthen cooperation in the areas of peace building initiatives to address regional conflicts. The comprehensive and detailed resolution will shortly be shared with all member parliaments for consideration and implementation. Honorable Speaker, in conclusion, I take this opportunity to record the thanks of the Parliament of Kenya to the eight member parliaments of the Republic of Angola, Republic of Burundi, the Central African Republic, the Democratic uh, Republic of the Congo, the Republic of Rwanda, the Republic of South Sudan, the United Republic of Tanzania, the Repub and the Republic of Zambia for honoring the invitation to this event and for their active participation in the deliberation. I thank you, Honorable Speaker. Now, honor members, there was uh, an indication that uh, the, the chairman of the Republican Committee on Administration and National Security was to respond to a request made by the member for Borabu, the, the Honorable Ben Mumanyi. But I see the chairman and the vice chair are both not present.
I've just been shown the, the, the response. I don't know why somebody was forwarding the, the statement to me. I, I don't even like seeing them because I don't know, I don't know where, they go, where, where they come from. But uh, I've, I've been shown, but I don't see the Honorable, the Honorable Mwadi and the other members of the, the vice chair. No, it can't be, and it cannot be responded by any other member. Anyhow, honor members, we we'll move to the next order so that we can conclude very quickly. So, sorry, leader majority. I will adjust what is on the order paper. Okay. What is shown on the order paper, I will adjust uh, so that it, it reads not later than than 3.15, not later than 3.15 p.m. is when I, wish I will invite the Cabinet Secretary. Proceed, Honorable Kimunya. Uh, Honorable Speaker, uh, pursuant to the provisions of Study Order Number 442A, I rise to give the following statement on behalf of the House Business Committee, which met on Tuesday, the 5th of April, 2022, to prioritize business for consideration. Honorable Speaker, as we are aware, uh, today, Pursuant to your ruling, we welcome the Cabinet Secretary for the National Treasury and Planning uh, to make a public pronouncement of the budget highlights and revenue raising measures for the government for the fiscal year 2022-2023 in accordance with Section 41 of the Public Finance Management Act of 2012 and studying orders number 25A and 244C. Now, Speaker, I wish to reiterate that time is of the essence for the House and as members would appreciate this urgent need to consider and approve the budget estimates for the financial year 2020-2023, in addition to other budget-related bills. I understand that committees are having quorum-related challenges, uh, making it difficult for them to process their business. I therefore wish to urge members to support the chairpersons and the House in the few sitting days remaining, so that any important business is finalized within the stipulated timelines. Honorable Speaker, uh, next week on Tuesday, the 12th of April, 2022, the following business has been scheduled for consideration. Number one is the committee of the whole house on the following bills. The coffee bill being Senate Bill number 22 of 2020 to continue from Clause 46. The Elections Amendment Bill, National Bill number 3 of 2022, the Elections Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 41 of 2021, and the Election Campaign Financing Amendment Bill of 2021. We'll also have the second reading of the following bills, the Huduma Bill 2021, which is a continuation, the Mang Bills Bill, Senate Bill Number 9 of 2020, the National Disaster Risk Management Bill of 2021, uh, the Prompt Payment Bill, which is Senate Bill Number 16 of 2021, and the Starter Bill, which is Senate Bill Number 1 of 2021. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I'm reliably informed that there are no questions scheduled uh, for responses by Cabinet Secretaries next week. Uh, the House Business Committee will therefore uh, reconvene on Tuesday, the 12th of April, 2022, uh, to schedule the business uh, for the rest of the week. Uh, Honorable Speaker, let me also take this opportunity uh, to thank you for representing us yesterday in the funeral of uh, the late uh, Speaker Jacob Olanya of Uganda, where I had the pleasure of accompanying you. And the people of Uganda uh, expressed their thanks to uh, the people of Kenya represented by this House. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I now wish to lay this statement on the table of the House. Thank you. Next one. Order number eight, the Elections Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill number three of 2022. Second reading, question to be put. Order, 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 order members, take your seats. Take your seats. Member for Endebes. Members, uh, debate on this uh, bill was concluded, and what remained was for the question to be put, which I hereby do. The elections amendment bill, 
National Assembly Bill Number no. Three of 2022 be read a second time. Will as many as that opinion say aye? aye. Will as many as the contrary opinion say nay? The eyes of it. A bill for an act of parliament to amend the Elections Act. Next. Order number nine, the Children's Bill, National Assembly Bill number 38 of 2021, second reading, question to be put. Again, honorable members, honorable Sankok, please. I think the member for Enderbase, you better go back to your place. That, that place doesn't appear to be good for you. Debate was also concluded on this bill, so what remains is for the question to be put, which I hereby do, that the children's bill, National Assembly Bill number 38 of 2021, be now read a second time. Will as many as of that opinion say aye? aye. Will as many as of the contrary opinion say nay? The eyes of it. A bill for an act of parliament to give effect to Article 53 of the Constitution to make provision for parental responsibility, fostering, adoption, custody, maintenance, guardianship, care, protection of children, care and protection of children, to make provision for and regulate the administration of children's institutions, to establish the National Children's Council Services and for connected purposes. Next, next order. Order number 10. Next order. Order number 10, approval of the mediated version of the county government's additional allocation bill, Senate Bill number 35 of 2021. Question to be put. Take your seat, member for Kitui Ruro. Well, members, uh, you should have dispensed with this business yesterday. I don't know why it's here today. Uh, anyhow, debate was concluded, so I proceed to put the question, which is that pursuant the provisions of Article 113, Clause 2 of the Constitution, and starting under 150, this House adopts a report of the mediated Mediation Committee on the County Government's Additional Allocation Bill, Senate Bill No. 35 of 2021, laid on the table of the House on Thursday, March 31st, 20, 2022, and approves the mediated version of the county government's additional allocation bill, Senate Bill Number 35 of 2021. Will as many as of that opinion say aye? aye. Will as many as of the contrary opinion say nay? The eyes of it. Order Number 11, Report of the Committee of the Whole House on its consideration of the Coffee Bill, Senate Bill Number 22 of 2020. Question to be put. Honor members, uh, again, debate was concluded. I proceed to put the question. The member for Awendo, where are you? Hey, don't, don't do that, don't do that. And I can see you are being misled by the, mem the experienced member for Suna East. <laughs> you just freeze. Honor members, uh, I put the question which is that this House do you agree with the report of the Committee of the Whole House on its consideration of the Coffee Bill, Senate Bill Number 22 of 2020, and seek leave to sit again? Will as many as of that opinion say aye? aye. Will as many as of the contrary opinion say nay? The eyes of it. The member for Suna East, uh, you may now take your usual seat. You have been away for a long time. Order number 12, the National Electronic Single Window System Bill, National Assembly Bill number 15 of 2021. Second reading, question to be put. Now, those of us who are walking very fast, please just be where you are. Remain where you are, member Vonieri. Please. I know, I know you have stayed for too long already. 
Let's just finish this business. Because, uh, honor members, you, co you complete the debate on, the, on this bill. Let me put the question, which is that the National Electronic Single Widow System Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 15 of 2021, be now read a second time. Will as many as without opinion say aye? Aye. Will as many as a contrary opinion say nay? The eyes of it. A bill for an act of parliament to provide for the establishment and oper operationalization of the national electronic single window system in order to facilitate trade, the establishment of the Kenya Trade Network Agency to provide for the electronic transaction and for connected purposes. Very well. Honour members, uh, I did indicate that I was making and, and amended the, what is on the order paper to read not later than 3.15 p.m. Majority Whip, please, if you could just take your seat now. Take your seat. Honour members, uh, I wish to make this communication relating to interruption of business. As the Cabinet Secretary for the National Treasury to make a public pronouncement of the budget policy highlights and revenue raising measures for the national government each financial year. In this regard, and as communicated earlier this week, the Cabinet Secretary will be making this pronouncement shortly. Honourable members, you will observe that this activity is taking place earlier than has been, the pre as has been in the previous years. This practice was adopted to allow the judiciary and parliament to submit to the National Treasury their budget estimates earlier during election years to enable conclusion of budget matters before the National Assembly at June's Senate prior to, the, to a general election. Honourable members, before inviting the Cabinet Secretary for the National Treasury to make the proposed budget pronouncements for the financial year 2022-2023, I wish to recognize the other Cabinet Secretaries, Principal Secretaries, and members of the Diplomatic Corps, Development Partners, Senior Government Officials, and other invited guests, and notably the Right Honourable Raila Molo Dinga. <laughs> who, say, who are sitting in the speaker's row. You are all welcome to the National Assembly. Now, therefore, honor members, pursuant to the provisions of the same Section 40 of the PFM Act and the National Assembly standing orders 25. A and 244C, I will now interrupt business of the House. Honorable Joshua Kutuni, it is disorderly to be communicating with a member from the other side of the aisle from your place. More particularly, yes. So, honorable members, uh, let me repeat. Now they have a pursuant to the same provisions of Section 40 of the Public Finance Management Act of 2012 and the National Assembly Standing Orders 25A and 244C, 
I will now interrupt business of the House to allow the Cabinet Secretary for the National Treasury to make a public pronouncement of the budget policy highlights and propose revenue raising measures for the national government for the financial year 2022-2023 and the medium term. Cabinet Secretary, please proceed to make your pronouncements. You're welcome. Mr. Speaker, it's once again an immense privilege for me to present to this August House and the people of the Republic of Kenya the budget statement that highlights the budget policies and the revenue raising measures for the financial year 2022-2023. The presentation of this statement is in fulfillment of the requirements of Section 40 of the Public Finance Management Act and the Standing Order Number 241 of the National Assembly. Mr. Speaker, our partner states in the East African community have agreed that Kenya can proceed with the early presentation of the budget statement this month. This aligns the budget calendar with the timelines for the general elections scheduled for August 2022. Mr. Speaker, His Excellency the President on Raburu Kenyatta took office in 2013. At that time, the country had just completed implementation of the first medium term plan of the Kenya Vision 2030 and was on the third year of implementation of the 2010 Constitution. During the first five years, his administration designed and implemented an economic transformation agenda under the second medium-term plan of Vision 2030. The agenda focused on key, five key pillars. One, improving the business climate by maintaining microeconomic stability, addressing security challenges, and reducing the cost of doing business. Two, closing the infrastructure gaps, Three, promoting investment in key sectors such as manufacturing, agriculture, and tourism. Four, sharing prosperity by investing in proper programs in health, education, and social welfare. And five, fostering the devolved system of government to enhance service delivery. Building on the progress made under the economic transformation agenda, the government initiated the Big Four agenda anchored on the third medium-term plan or the Vision 2030. The government focused on transforming the lives of Kenyans through strategic interventions on food and nutritional security, affordable housing, manufacturing for job creation, and universal health coverage. Mr. Speaker, while we celebrate the remarkable achievements from the past investments in the priority programs and at the economic transformation agenda, uh, agenda and the Big Four, the country continues to grapple with various social, economic, and environmental challenges. In preparing this year's budget, we extensively consulted Kenyans. The insights, comments, and suggestions have informed the priorities laid in this budget. Key among the concerns, one, the high cost of living, two, high level of unemployment among the youth, three, income inequality, and four, public debt burden. Mr. Speaker, we have noted that most of the concerns raised by Kenyans were associated with the negative effects of COVID-19 pandemic. In response, the government developed and implemented appropriate economic policies and rolled out targeted programs that cushioned the citizens and businesses from the adverse effects of the pandemic. Building on the progress realized, we have outlined policies in this budget that are geared towards returning the economy back on a more sustainable growth path for improved livelihoods. In pursuit of this, we have therefore chosen this year's uh, budget theme as accelerating economic recovery for, livelihood, for improved livelihoods. The government will implement economic policies and undertake structural reforms geared towards improving the welfare of Kenyans. This includes aligning and accelerating implementation of the Big Four Agenda and the third e economic stimulus program for sustainable growth. Mr. Speaker, conscious of the constrained fiscal space, we intend to implement these policy measures within a sustainable fiscal framework. Indeed, we have moderated our spending levels uh, targets and ensure cautious revenue projections. We have re reprioritized public spending towards proper expenditures in health, education, 
and supporting the vulnerable segment of the population. In addition, we are leveraging on the public-private partnership to fund a project, support the private sector, and narrow fiscal deficit. Mr. Speaker, the next section of my statement will give highlights of the economic policy context, policy priorities of the government, and the strategy for accelerated economic recovery. I will later provide highlights for the fiscal framework underpinning this budget, spending priorities, and the proposed tax policy measures. Mr. Speaker, this year's budget has been prepared against a backdrop of a moderate global growth of 4.4% from a recovery of 5.9% in 2021. The global economy contracted by 3.1% in 2020 following the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic. However, there are risks to this growth outlook, largely from possible emergence of COVID-19 pand pandemic and the ongoing conflict in Eastern Europe. Mr. Speaker, Kenya's economy demonstrated remarkable resilience to the COVID-19 shock in 2020 and staged a strong recovery in 2021. Following the easing of the COVID-19 restrictions, reopening of the economy, as well as targeted stimulus intervention by government, the economy registered a strong recovery of 9.9% in the third quarter of 2021. Overall, the economy is estimated to have expanded by 7.6% in 2021 a much stronger level from contraction of 0.3% in 2020. In 2022, the economy is projected to stabilize at 6%, supported by recovery in agriculture, industry, and service sectors. Mr. Speaker, to further strengthen this growth outlook, the government will continue to safeguard microeconomic stability by ensuring inflation remains within the government target range, while interest rate remains stable to support growth in private se uh, sector credit. The foreign exchange market is largely expected to remain stable with foreign exchange reserves providing buffers against shocks in the foreign exchange market. The current account deficit is projected at 5.9% of GDP in 2022, supported by a rebound in horticulture and tea exports, as well as increased inflows of remittances. Mr. Speaker, the economic outlook may be affected by emerging domestic and external risk. On the domestic front, Reemergence of COVID-19 variant and possible adverse weather conditions could reverse the projected economic recovery. On the external front, the ongoing conflict in Eastern Europe has created uncertainties that will affect the global economic outlook through disruptions of supply chains, rising global oil prices, and increased infl inflationary uh, pressures. Mr. Speaker, the government will monitor all the domestic and external risk and take appro appropriate policy actions to cushion the economy and Kenyans in the event the risk materializes. Mr. Speaker, in 2017, the government has progressively implemented policies and programs under the Big Four agenda to foster socioeconomic development. However, the COVID-19 pandemic slowed down the implementation and full realization of the expected benefits. Mr. Speaker, to further accelerate economic recovery and improve livelihoods, the government will continue to implement and expand the economic recovery program in this budget. The program is hinged on a sound macroeconomic policy framework that aims to, one, enhance security for our citizens and their properties while fostering a secure and conducive business environment. Two, scale up development of critical infrastructure in roads, rail, energy, and water sectors. This will ease movements of people and goods, reduce the cost of doing business, enhance access to social amenities, and promote Kenya's competitiveness. Three, enhance transformation of key economic sectors for broad-based sustainable recovery by promoting agricultural productivity, growth in manufacturing, environmental conservation and water supply, support tourism recovery, and ensure sustainable land use and management. Four, expand access to quality services in health, education, and appropriate social safety nets for the vulnerable population. Five, support the youth, women, and persons living with disabilities through government-funded empowerment programs. Six, continue supporting the evolved system of government through active engagements, policy guidance, and timely transfers of shareable revenues. This will indeed strengthen county government systems and enhance quality service delivery. And lastly, sustain implementation of various reforms targeted at enhancing efficiency in the delivery of public services. Mr. Speaker, the implementation of the economic recovery program 
that's all supported by the International Monetary Fund is fully on track. The IMF program has four key objectives. First, scaling up the COVID-19 response by supporting health and other sectors most impacted by the pandemic. Second, reducing debt vulnerabilities by pursuing a revenue-driven fiscal consolidation plan that targets to stabilize debt to GDP ratio and subsequently put it on a downward level. Third, supporting the structural and governance reforms while addressing weaknesses in state-owned enterprises with a view to enhancing efficiency in the management of economic and fiscal affairs. And fourth, implementing specific measures to strengthen the mo uh, monetary policy framework and support financial uh, stability. Mr. Speaker, alongside the formation, the government has continued with the implementation of various stimulus programs to manage COVID-19 pandemic, support businesses, and general employment in order to minimize the adverse socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Speaker, in the financial year 2021-2022, the third phase of the economic stimulus program and the, and the implementation targeted, one, the Kazi Mutani program to create employment for over 200,000 youth across the country. Two, preparation of the, of the education sector for the transition in the competency-based curriculum by considering new classrooms to accommodate more than one million people expected to join junior secondary schools in January 2023. Three, construction of additional 50 new level three hospitals in uncovered and densely populated areas across the country to enhance access to the medical services. Four, supporting livelihoods of farmers within the sugar belt, provision of fertilizer subsidy to small scale tea farmers, and completion of the ongoing intervention in the COVID subsector. And five, supporting communities affected by drought in arid and semi arid regions of the country. Mr. Speaker, in this statement, I'll be proposing additional allocation to various activities under the economic stimulus program to further support livelihoods and stimulate economic activities. Mr. Speaker, in this budget, the government will strive to enhance the role of the private sector in the economy, including financing infrastructure projects through the public-private partnership, support micro, small, and medium enterprises by facil facilitating access to finance, invest in ICT and digital infrastructure to support the use of digital platform to facilitate e-commerce and efficient delivery of public services, promote and strengthen local and foreign resource mobilization efforts to sustain funding of the identified development projects and programs, improve social protection through targeted policy interventions and programs to promote local production processes and domestic supply value chains, and, and lastly, strengthen the monitoring and evaluation system for quality outcomes of the projects. Mr. Speaker, implementation of the socioeconomic policies and structural reforms have seen Kenya graduate from a low income to a middle income country with an estimated per capita income of Kenya shilling 244,000 in 2021. This is a significant leap of 92.1% from the level of Kenya Shilling 127,000 in 2013. Our vision is to achieve the upper middle income status by 2030 with a minimum per capita income of at least Kenya Shilling 453,000. Mr. Speaker, looking back since, since 2013, when the current government took reign of power, Kenya has achieved monumental milestones, especially at the macroeconomic level. For instance, the economy has grown by 155% from the value of Kenya shilling 5.3 trillion in 2013 to Kenya shilling 13.5 trillion in 2022. Two, a strong economic growth averaging 4.6% has been realized over the period, including impressive recovery of 7.6% in 2021 from a contraction of 0.3% in 2020 occasioned by the COVID-19 pandemic. Third, cumulatively 5.1 million new jobs in both formal and informal sectors were created. Fourthly, the economy has maintained microeconomic stability with inflation rate within target and interest rates remaining stable. The average annual inflation rate declined from 7.2% in 2013 to 5.7% in 2021. Fifthly, the commercial bank lending to the private sector doubled from Kenya shilling 1.5 trillion to Kenya shilling 3.1 trillion in 2021. Sixth, six, successfully lengthened the average time to maturity for treasury bonds from 7.4 years in June 2013 to nine years in March 2022. 
This has improved the maturity of profile of domestic debt and supported refinancing risk mitigation. Seventh, the foreign exchange market has remained stable with the official foreign exchange reserves increasing from US dollar 6.5 billion or 4.4 months of import cover to US dollar 9.5 billion or 5.6 months of import cover in 2021. The current account deficit improved by dropping from 7.7% of GDP in 2013 to 4.9% of GDP in 2021, effectively supporting the stability of the foreign exchange market. Annual diaspora remittance grew by close to 300% from Kenya shilling 112 billion in 2013 to the current Kenya shilling 436 billion in 2022. Foreign direct investment rose from Kenya shilling 56.7 trillion in 2013 to Kenya shilling 75.1 trillion in 2027. Ordinary revenue collection has more than doubled from Kenya shilling 0.8 trillion in the financial year 2012-2013 to Kenya shilling 1. 8 trillion in the financial 2020-21 and further to Kenya shilling 2 trillion in the financial 2021-2022. The poverty prevalence rate declined from 36.1% in 2013 to 33.6% in 2019. Mr. Speaker, the ongoing police reforms aimed at protecting lives and enhancing general security of the citizens have significantly improved the ratio of police to citizen from one policeman to 1,000 citizens in 2012 to the current one policeman to 462 citizens. With regard to the infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, the government has constructed an additional 10,500 kilometers of tarmac roads spread across the 47 counties, facilitating efficient movement of people and goods, thereby rapidly stimulating economic activities. Mr. Speaker, the completion of the standard gauge railway has not only eased movement of passengers during the period but also led to the transportation of uh, 17.6 million tons of cargo between 2018 and 2021. During this period, over 6.5 6 million passengers have used the standard gauge railway. This has had positive effects on the economy, including creation of jobs. Mr. Speaker, within the same period, the government tripled power generation from 1,300 megawatts to the current 3,900 megawatts. Of these, 73% is from green source, thus consolidating Kenya's leading generation of green energy in Africa. This has significantly increased the number of households connected to electricity to more than 8.3 million today, compared to 2.3 million in 2013. Mr. Speaker, the international oil prices have been rap rapidly rising for close to a year without any sign of easing. Conscious of the adverse impact of the high oil prices on all sectors of the economy, the government has taken deliberate steps to subsidize palm prices through the Petroleum uh, Development Levy Fund. This action has stabilized palm prices and consequently prices of goods and services. The government remains committed to provide adequate resources to mitigate the rising cost of fuel. Mr. Speaker, in its pursuit to increase productivity while staying on the economic transformation trajectory, the government has sustained the pace of investment in all sectors. The agricultural sector remains the largest contributor to our GDP and priority under the Big Four Agenda on food and nutrition security. The government has continued to support large-scale production of staple food, expanded irrigation schemes, increased access to agricultural inputs, and supported smallholder farmers to sustainably produce and market various commodities. In addition, the government introduced the warehouse receipt system to reduce post-harvest losses. Mr. Speaker, the price of fertilizer has more than doubled in the last one year and is still rising. To safeguard food security in the country, the government has allocated Kenya shilling three, three billion to subsidize farmers during the current planting season. We propose to allocate a further Kenya shilling 2.7 billion in the financial 2022-2023 to cushion the farmers while sustaining food production. Mr. Speaker, to strengthen land and property ownership, the government has issued over 5.3 million title deeds over the last eight years. The government has also fully digitized land records in Nairobi registry under the National Land Information Management System, referred to the Sasa program, to improve accessibility of land records and lowering the cost of land transaction. Mr. Speaker, Kenya's emergent oceans and blue economy will remain a key growth engine for the country. In the last five years, the country has heavily invested in measures to expand marine fisheries 
grow marine transport and logistics, and establishing Kenya as a source of quality and cost-effective labor. These measures have resulted in ongoing in the opening of the Lamu port, reopening of the port of Kisumu, establishment of the nursing shipyards at the port of Mombasa and Kisumu, revival of the Kenya National Shipping Line, construction of an ultra-modern tuna fish hub at Liwatoni in Mombasa, among others. Mr. Speaker, with the proposed interventions, the sector is on course to be among the top five key contributors to the Kenyan economy and a game changer in enhancement of the socioeconomic fortunes of the Kenyans living next to our marine resources. Mr. Speaker, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the government's strategy to revive the tourism sector has yielded positive results. The earnings from the sector had increased by 74% from Kenya shilling 94 billion in 2013 to Kenya shilling 163.6 billion in 2019. Tourist arrivals had also increased from 1.5 million to 2, uh, 2 million during the same period. In 2020, these numbers, numbers significantly declined due to the adverse effects of COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Speaker, in the health sector, hospital bed capacity increased from 56,069 in 2013 to 82,291 in 2020. These increases are attributed to over 1,912 new hospitals constructed across the country by the National County Government. Further, the introduction of free maternity maternal health care program, dubbed Linda Mama, initiated in 2016 has led to the decline of maternal mortality rate by 26%. This program alongside the Beyond Zero campaign led by the First Lady has significantly contributed to the improvement of maternal health care in the country. Mr. Speaker, to address the growing cancer burden over the last decade, the government has formulated appropriate policies and allocated sufficient resources to guide the delivery of cancer testing and treatment services. Some of these interventions include, one, establishment of the National Cancer Institute as an overall coordinating agency, two, construction and equipment of comprehensive cancer centers at Kenyatta National Hospital in Mombasa, Nakuru, and Garissa counties, and three, support to 10 county referral hospitals to operationalize chemotherapy clinics. Mr. Speaker, to address the quality of education in the country, the government has rolled out radical reforms in the sector that have significantly improved the quality of education in the country. For instance, the investment in the sector has seen the number of primary schools increase from 26,549 to 32,437, and secondary schools from 7,174 7, to 10,413 between 2012 and 2020. The number of technical and vocational education training institutions also increased from 701 to 2,301 during the same period. As a measure of unprecedented success, transition rates from the primary and secondary schools moved from 64.5% in 2012 to the current 100%. In addition, under the radical competence-based curriculum, the plan for the first group to join junior secondary schools in January 2013 is well on course. Mr. Speaker, following the sustained investment in human capital development, Kenya was impressively ranked position three in sub-Saharan African region with a human capital index of 0 0.55 in the year 2020. Mr. Speaker, from 2013 to 2021, the government disbursed Kenya shilling 151.6 billion through the Inua Jamii program support of 1.2 million vulnerable persons among them orphans, the elderly, and persons living with severe disabilities. Further, the government disbursed Kenya shilling 6.95 6 billion to support women, youth, and persons with disability and disabilities enterprises through 74,021 groups under the Ways of Fund. Mr. Speaker, to improve efficiency in the delivery of government services, the government initiated and operationalized 52 Uduma centers across the country. In 2014, the government has launched the e-citizen platform where 350 government services have now been successfully migrated. The platform has since served over 27.2 million customers while raising Kenya shilling 87.1 billion in revenue for the government. Mr. Speaker, in 2013, the government successfully rolled out implementation of the 2010 constitution. The 47 county governments 
independence commissions and other institutions established by the constitution were duly operationalized, albeit with huge financial requirement, thereby straining the, the country's fiscal position. Mr. Speaker, to build on the milestones achieved so far, we'll be implementing the following policy, legal, and institutional reforms to improve the business environment, increase efficiency in public service delivery, and strengthen transparency and accountability in public finance management. Mr. Speaker, the government has, has continued to implement various reforms and procurement to improve efficiency and transparency, enhance good governance, and promote savings in the procurement uh, process. Among the reforms is the procurement of an end-to-end e-government procurement system whose pilot phase will commence in July 2022 with a target date for full rollout to all ministries, departments, and agencies in January 2023. Mr. Speaker, on framework contracting, we have submitted to this House for enactment the Public Procurement and Asset Disposal Bill 2021. This bill provides for multiple awards where several bidders can be awarded the same contract. Once, it, once enacted, it will hasten the delivery of services to citizenry and support local farms, particularly in specialized areas like pharmaceuticals, supply of foodstuffs, and commodity markets. Mr. Speaker, further, we have put together a framework that harmonizes the qualification for supply chain management personnel that clarifies competencies for the various cadres in the supply chain management function. In this respect, I direct all procuring entities to adhere to the requirement of this framework. Mr. Speaker, the government commitment to empowering SMEs owned by women, youth, and persons with disabilities under the Access to Government Procurement Opportunities Program remains firmly on course. In this respect, National Treasury has re-engineered the AGBO portal to enable real-time registration and monitoring. The system has further been linked to other government institutions to facilitate faster verification and reporting. Mr. Speaker, we have undertaken a comprehensive assessment of vulnerabilities in state-owned enterprises. In particular, the in-depth financial evaluations of selected state-owned enterprises, excluding Kenya Airways, that face the largest financial and fiscal risk, revealed a cumulative liquidity gap of Kenya shilling 383 billion over the next five years. This gap is expected to be covered by undertaking specific policy interventions to improve, to improve efficiencies, reduce costs, and increase revenue. Mr. Speaker, in order to enhance the operational and financial efficiency of state-owned enterprises, we shall first implement the blueprint on governance reforms, on enforcement and separation of roles and responsibilities among institutions that exercise oversight. Second, fast track the implementation of government investment management information system and capture, among others, all loan advance to the enterprises. Third, extend the coverage of financial evaluations to other state-owned enterprises to be able to anticipate, quantify, monitor, manage, and mitigate fiscal risk from the state corporations. Mr. Speaker, Kenya always plays a major and catalytic role in the economic development of this country. The airline is facing severe cash flow constraints following the global lockdowns triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic. The government has a major shareholder supporting the restructuring of Kenya Airways to adapt to the challenges facing the aviation industry due to the adverse impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Kenya Airways will be required to trim its network, operationalize frequencies of, rationalize frequencies of flights, operate a smaller fleet, and rationalize its staff complement. I'll be proposing a budget allocation to meet the restructuring costs. Mr. Speaker, the government will continue to support Kenya Power and Lightning Company to increase its efficiency while sustaining systematic reduction in tariff to electricity users. The recent 15% tariff reduction by the government has not only brought immediate relief to the consumers, but also led to the realization of broad benefits, including reductions of prices of goods by manufacturers. Mr. Speaker, the Kenyan banking sector is stable and has shown great resilience with strong capital and liquidity buffers built on reforms initiated by the Central Bank of Kenya. A clear demonstration of resilience and recovery of the banking sector from the adverse effects of COVID-19 pandemic was strong capital adequacy and liquidity ratio. As at the end of December 2021, capital adequacy ratio was 19.6%, which was above the minimum requirement of 14.5%, while liquidity ratio was 56.2%, 
which is also above the 20% requirement. The sector has continued with its transformation journey under the Kenya Banking Sector Charter, issued in 2019 by the Central Bank of Kenya. The charter focuses on strengthening risk-based credit pricing, entrenching customer centricity in the operations, and ensuring ethical culture in the banks. In addition, the Central Bank of Kenya Act 2021 was enacted to provide the Central Bank with powers to license and oversight the previously unregulated digital credit providers. Mr. Speaker, commercial banks face climate-related risk in their operations. In this regard, the CBK issued a detailed guidelines on climate-related risk management to all commercial banks in 2021, in October 2021. The banks are now required to integrate climate-related risk into the operation overall risk management framework. Mr. Speaker, the Fin Access Survey 2021 conducted in, in the 47 counties revealed that access to formal financial services improved from 82.9% in 2019 to 83.7% in 2021. The increase of 0.8% access through the formal channels was attributed to the progress made by Kenya to expand financial access through various channels, including mobile money financial platforms. Access through the informal uh, channels, on the other hand, reduced from 6.1% to 4.7%, while the excluded population increased slightly from 11% to 11.6% during the same period. Mr. Speaker, over the last 15 years, an elaborate financial service ecosystem in Kenya has evolved from an initial basic money transfer innovation. In this period, access to financial services has increased from 26% of adults in 2006 to the current 83%. Further, the government has rolled out mobile money, strengthened real-time growth settlement system, and established a regional payment system at both the East African community and Comesa region. In order to strengthen the national payment system, Mr. Speaker, the Central Bank of Kenya in February 2022 launched the national payment strategy 2022-2025, which seeks to realize a faster, secure, efficient, and collaborative payment system that supports financial inclusion and innovation, while reinforcing the emergence of 24-hour economy. Mr. Speaker, in order to attract increased financing and investment in Kenya, the Nairobi International Financial System Authority has put in place the required operating framework and regulations. With the necessary framework now in place, and the official openings later, later in the year, NIFCA will be expected to be a key catalyst in supporting the economic growth. Mr. Speaker, the Kenya Mogai Refinance Company continues to play a leading role in the delivery of affordable housing in Kenya. I am pleased to know that since September 2020, KMRC has disbursed over two billion to seven primary mortgage lenders and is currently processing an additional seven billion. To provide a sustainable source of funding and to complement the existing credit lines, the company whose bond was recently listed at the Nairobi Security Exchange successfully issued its first corporate bond of Kenya Shilling 1.4 billion under the medium term note program of Kenya Shilling 10.5 billion. Mr. Speaker, since the launch of the Credit Guarantee Scheme in December 2020, total loans ex extended to micro, small, and medium enterprises under this scheme had surpassed Kenya Shilling 2.2 billion by December 2021. This has expanded access to affordable credit to micro, small, and medium enterprises to 45 counties across 11 different sectors of the economy. To enhance coverage of the scheme, additional participating financial intermediaries will be brought on board. Further, the government will seek support of development partners to increase the scheme's capital from the current Kenya Shilling 4 billion to Kenya Shilling 10 billion over the medium term. Mr. Speaker, to deepen capital markets, the government is undertaking a review of the legal and regulatory framework to address emerging issues in the capital market space. This includes, among others, aspects on collective investment schemes and investment uh, based crowd, uh, crowd funding. In addition, the government is installing a new central security de de uh, depository system at the Central Bank of Kenya to support planned reforms in the sec secondary trading of government bonds. Mr. Speaker, to enable more investment advisors offer investment advisory services, I propose to amend the Capital Markets Act to expand the spectrum of persons 
who can act as investment advisors. This will allow single director companies and partnerships to be licensed as investment advisors. Mr. Speaker, the payroll of the public service pension continues to grow and add more than 300,000 pensioners and dependents as of December 2021. The National Treasury will roll out the much awaited re engineered pension management system in the course of the financial year. The system will offer an end to end enterprise resource planning solution in the management and processing of pension benefits. Mr. Speaker, the public service superannuation scheme that was operationalized in January 2021 has attracted more than 352,000 members with a current fund value of current shilling 27 billion. The scheme is eventually expected to ease pressure on the pension wage, wage bill while guaranteeing sustainability of public service uh, pension. Mr. Speaker, to further improve the pension policy framework, the National Treasury is developing an overarching national pension policy that sets the guiding principles for application across board on structuring and management of retirement benefits for public servants. In order to widen the scope of investment where pension schemes can invest their fund, Mr. Speaker, I propose to amend the retirement benefits investment guideline to include the unlisted real estate investment trust incorporated in Kenya that are approved by the Capital Markets Authority. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the much awaited government backed pension scheme for, in, for informal sector workers, Kenya National Entrepreneur Saving Trust, Kenneth, targeting 15 million marginalized informal sector workers, has now been registered. To operationalize the scheme, the government is restructuring the M. Makiba bond platform for safe and secure investment for the unique heterogeneous informal workers. To this effect, the National Treasury is working with stakeholders in the financial sector to roll out the scheme across the 47 counties in the course of this financial year. Mr. Speaker, in the recent times, motorcycles and three-wheelers have increasingly been engaged in commercial fare-paying passengers' business. Unfortunately, the number of accidents in this category of business have been on a steady rise, yet the owners of motorcycles do not have insurance cover to cater for any treatment in case of injuries or compensation in case of death or any other damages caused by an accident involving motorcycles. In this respect, I propose to amend the insurance regulations to require motorcycles and three-wheelers used by fare-paying passengers to take insurance for their passengers. Mr. Speaker, in an effort to strengthen disaster risk management in the country, the government will fast track the enactment of the disaster risk management policy and bill, finalize the disaster risk management strategy, and update, uh, update the disaster risk financing strategy. In addition, the National Treasury will expedite the finalization of public finance management uh, regulation 2022. Mr. Speaker, in order to demonstrate our commitment in addressing climate change, the government will implement the financing locally led climate action program, a 10 year financing program aimed at mobilizing climate finances to support local communities build their resilience and adapt to the impacts of climate change in four seven counties. In the financial year 2022-2023, I propose to allocate Kenya Shilling 6.1 billion to this program. Mr. Speaker, in addition, the government has finalized the long-term low emission strategy to guide a low carbon climate resilient development path. To address the financing challenge of climate change actions, the government will develop a climate finance mobilization strategy. Further, in order to promote private sector investments in green projects and programs, the government will fast track the finalization of the national policy framework on green fiscal incentives and development of the carbon mechanism design. In the forestry sector, the government is committed to expand the country's tree cover from the current 7.2% to the 10% target. The government is revitalizing efforts to meet this important target through resource mobilization with partners and engagement with the counties to dedicate more areas and resources under the forestry regimes, as well as tackling the catchment de degradation that has contributed to the rising lakes a phenomenon. In this regard, I propose to allocate Kenya Shilling 10.2 billion to support conservation of forests and water towers. Mr. Speaker, in order to encourage reporting and recovery of identified assets by the Unclaimed Financial Assets Authority, I propose to amend the Unclaimed Finance Assets Act to provide for waiver of penalties, fines, 
and audit fees in justifiable circumstances, as well as to cap accumulation of penalties and interest to the value of, of the assets. I also propose a 12-month voluntary disclosure program to grant relief of penalties on the unclaimed financial assets declared and delivered in the next 12 months under the program. Mr. Speaker, Article 173 of our Constitution established a judiciary fund, which will be administered by the Chief Registrar in meeting the administrative expenses of the judiciary. In this respect, the necessary procedures for operationalization of the fund have been put in place. In particular, the following have so far been achieved. One, the Judiciary Fund Act and regulations have been enacted. Two, the bank accounts for the fund have been opened at the Central Bank of Kenya. Three, an appropriate budget for judiciary in the financial year 2022-2023 has been created. And four, if means has been enhanced to accommodate judiciary fund operation. This fund will be fully operational with effect from 1st July 2022. Mr. Speaker, the fiscal policy supporting the budget for the financial year 2022-23 and also the medium term is designed to accelerate economic recovery for improved livelihood for Kenyans. Mr. Speaker, as mentioned earlier, one of the objectives of our economic recovery program is to reduce the debt vulnerabilities by pursuing a revenue-driven fiscal consolidation. In this regard, the government has developed a draft national tax policy to guide tax administration that will soon be shared with stakeholders and peer review institutions for input. Further, the government is developing a medium-term revenue strategy to boost tax revenues, improve the tax system, and link taxation to our development needs over the medium term. Mr. Speaker, in addition, the government will continue to rationalize tax expenditures and retain those whose intention is to promote investment and ensure sustainability and value for money from our resources. In the, in the tax expenditure report 2021, we noted a significant decline in the level of tax expenditure from 5.17% of GDP in 2017 to 2.96% 2 as a percentage of GDP in 2020. We shall continue to review the existing tax expenditure in order to boost the tax revenue. Mr. Speaker, we project total revenue collection including appropriation in aid and grants for the financial year 2022-2023 budget to be Kenya shilling 2.4 trillion, equivalent to 17.5% of GDP. Of these, ordinary revenue is projected at Kenya shilling 2.14 trillion, equivalent to 15.3% of GDP. On the other hand, Mr. Speaker, total expenditure in the financial year 2022-2023 is projected at, three, at Kenya shilling 3.3 trillion, equivalent to 23.9% of GDP. Recurrent expenditure will amount to Kenya shilling 2.2 trillion, while development expenditure, including allocation to foreign finance projects, contingency fund, and conditional transfers to county government, is Kenya shilling 715.5 billion. The funding is expected to accelerate completion of ongoing infrastructure projects. The equitable share to county is projected at Kenya shilling 370 billion. Mr. Speaker, given the projected revenues and grants against the projected expenditure, the fiscal deficit is projected to decline to Kenya shilling 862.5 billion, equivalent to 6.2% of GDP in the financial year 2022-2023, from Kenya shilling 1 trillion 24 billion, equivalent to 8.1% of GDP in the financial year 2021-2022. The fiscal deficit will be financed through net external financing of Kenya shilling 280 billion, equivalent to 2% of GDP and net domestic financing of Kenya shilling 581 billion, equivalent to 4.2% of GDP. Mr. Speaker, our medium-term fiscal consolidation policy targets to progressively reduce the level of fiscal deficit from Kenya shilling 862 billion, equivalent 6.2% of GDP in the financial year 2022-23, to Kenya shilling 634.1 billion, equivalent 3.2% of GDP in the financial year 2025-26. Mr. Speaker, Kenya has implemented reforms in public debt management to strengthen debt transparency and accountability. The, debt, the depth of coverage and disclosures on public 
uh, death information has been enhanced in line with the best practices. A broad range of information on public death is readily available to the general public on the National Treasury website, while an investor relations unit within the Public Death Management Office facilitates investor, lender, and public engagements on public death issues. Mr. Speaker, Kenya's debt carrying capacity is rated moderate, and the overall public debt is sustainable. We have initiated implementation of a, of a set of measures to lower cost and risk in the public debt portfolio. These measures include cancellation of some non-disbursing external loans, rearrangements of syndicated external loans, and increasing the issuance of treasury bonds to lengthen the maturity structure and improve debt sustainability indicators. The private debt financing are highly concessional loans offered at below market interest rates with long repayment period. Recourse to commercial borrowing has been maintained at minimum levels. Mr. Speaker, the current legal numerical public debt ceiling has constrained public funding of projects while at the same time failing to consider the effects of external shocks on the economy. In this regard, we propose to replace the debt ceiling with a debt anchor and set it at 55% of debt to GDP in present value terms. This is in line with internationally accepted uh, conventional practice. Further, we provided an, a requirement that the Cabinet Secretary National Treasury reports to Parliament whenever the debt level swings beyond the threshold with time-bound remedial actions. This approach ensures that debt remains within sustainable levels and entrenches accountability and transparency in public debt management. I have forwarded to this August House the necessary changes to the PFM Max to align ourselves with this desired position and request that the House consider it favorably. Mr. Speaker, the public-private partnership program has gained traction and under the new PPP Act 2021 that has reduced the number of approval processes, introduced timelines and strengthened the institutional framework by elevating the PPP unit to a director in the National Treasury. So far, the government has achieved closure on a number of projects, of which a key one seeks to deliver over 400, over 4,000 housing units to frontline Kenya Defense Force personnel. Mr. Speaker, to ensure projects with the highest socioeconomic returns are selected and implemented, we are putting in place a joint public investment management and public-private partnership planning framework and strengthening the co coordination between the Public Debt Management Office and the Public-Private Partnership Directorate for effective control of fiscal exposure as envisioned the new PPP Act 2021. Further, the government will fully operationalize the Public-Private Partnership Project Facilitation Fund to support activities of the PPP Directorate and those of the contracting authorities in preparation phase of a project during the tendering process and project uh, appraisal. Mr. Speaker, in view of the limited fiscal space, the government will embark on rationalizing the existing portfolio of projects being implemented by the national government and issue regulations for managing public investment. The government has developed the Public Investment Management Information System, which is expected to be a rep repository of all projects implemented by the national and county government. Mr. Speaker, let me now turn to the highlights of the government's pending priorities in the coming financial year. In light of the revenue challenges and significant expenditure demands, spending, spending in the financial 2022-2023 will focus on supporting economic recovery and the Big Four agenda to ensure the highest impact on the well-being of Kenyans. The proposed total program spending for the financial year 2022-2023 amounts to Kenya shilling 3.3 trillion. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned earlier, the government is implementing the, implementing the third economic stimulus program of financially 30.1 billion to accelerate the pace of economic growth and sustain the gains realized so far. To further enhance the ongoing interventions, I propose a total of Kenya shilling 20.6 billion in this budget support implementation of various activities. Mr. Speaker, out of this, Kenya shilling 2.1 billion is for the youth empowerment and employment creation under the Kazi Mutani program. Kenya shilling 8.2 billion for improving educational outcomes. 
canceling 1.3 billion for improving health outcomes, canceling 5.8 billion for improving environment, water and sanitation facilities, canceling 1.5 billion for fertilizer subsidy, and canceling 1.6 billion for enhancing liquidity to business. Mr. Speaker, to support implementation of the projects and programs under the Big Four agenda, I have proposed a total of Kenyan shilling 146.8 billion. Mr. Speaker, we have continued to strengthen our healthcare systems in our quest for universal health coverage. Better health outcomes depend on the availability, accessibility, and capacity of health workers to deliver quality services anchored on well equipped and provisioned healthcare facilities. Towards this end, the government has implemented various initiatives laying ground for achieving the goal of 100% health insurance coverage. Key among these initiatives include the free maternity program Dam Glinda Mama, which currently benefits over 1 million mothers annually, increasing the total number of health workers in the public and private sector, investments in the health infrastructure, and development of a digital health platform to support effective monitoring of the health uh, sector. In addition, the government enacted the NHIF Amendment Act, which provides for the establishment of a centralized healthcare provider management system to ensure efficient management and payment of claims, as well as data collection. Mr. Speaker, to further enhance realization of the universal health coverage, I propose to allocate Kenya shilling 146.8 billion to the healthcare sector to support the various programs aimed at improving healthcare outcomes. Of this amount, Kenya shilling 62.3 billion will fund activities and programs for the attainment to universal health coverage. Specific allocation for various activities and programs includes Kenya shilling 7 billion for purchase of COVID vaccines and related expenditure, Kenya shilling 4.1 billion for free maternity health care, Kenya shilling 5.2 billion for the managed equipment services, as well as Kenya shilling 1.8 billion to provide medical cover for the elderly and severely disabled persons in our society. Mr. Speaker, to lower cases of HIV AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis in the country, Kenya shilling 16.2 billion has been recommended for the purpose. To enhance vaccines and immunization program, I propose an allocation of Kenya shilling 5.2 billion. Mr. Speaker, to further improve health, health service delivery, Kenya shilling 18.1 billion has been proposed for the Kenyatta National Hospital, Kenya shilling 11.7 billion for the Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital, Kenya shilling 7.7 .7 billion for the Kenya Medical Training Center, Kenya shilling 2.9 billion for the Kenya Medical Research Institute, Kenya shilling 1.1 billion for the construction of Kenya National Hospital Bands and uh, Pediatric Center, Kenya shilling 1.2 billion for procurement of family planning and reproductive health care communities, Kenya shilling 300 million for procurement of cyber knife radiotherapy equipment, Kenya shilling 1.3 billion for the construction of cancer center at Kisi Level 5 Hospital, and Kenya shilling 619 million for the procurement of equipment at the National uh, Blood Transfusion Services. Mr. Speaker, in 2013, the government embarked on a plan to provide decent and affordable houses for Kenyans. This was envisaged to create additional jobs, provide market for manufacturers as well as suppliers, and raise the contribution of real estate and construction sector to GDP. To achieve this, government has been implementing policy and administrative reforms targeted at lowering the cost of construction and improving access to finance for affordable housing. The government has also mobilized resources to support construction of affordable housing units and social housing units. Building on the gains and to ensure success of this initiative, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya shilling to 27.7 billion for the affordable housing program. The proposed allocation includes Kenya shilling 4.5 uh, 6 billion to Kenya mortgage refinance company for enhancement of the company's capital as well as for own lending to primary mortgage lenders. Kenya shilling 8.7 billion for construction of affordable housing units as well as Kenya shilling 1.2 billion for construction of social housing units. Mr. Speaker, to support the Ni Nairobi Metropolitan Services in reversing urban indignity in Nairobi County, Kenya shilling 200 million has been recommended for the Nairobi Metropolitan Services Improvement Project, and Kenya shilling 100 and 
18.7 million for construction of footbridges. Other key allocations to the housing, urban development, and public park sector include Kenya Shilling 5.9 billion for the Kenyan Formal Settlement Development Project 2, Kenya Shilling 700 million for construction of markets, Kenya Shilling 1 billion for maintenance of government pool houses, Kenya Shilling 1.1 billion for the construction of housing unit for the National Police and, and Kenya Prison. Kenya Shilling 700 million for the Kenya Urban Program. In addition, Mr. Speaker, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 1.2 billion to support the Nairobi Bus Rapid Transport Project to offer an efficient and time-saving public transport. Mr. Speaker, implementation of the appropriate policies coupled with enhanced investments in the manufacturing sector has created a conducive business environment to support and protect local industries, generation of jobs, and improve, improve livelihoods. Mr. Speaker, to further promote local industries, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 10.1 billion under the various implement, implementing ministries, departments, and agencies. Out of this, Kenya Shilling 1 billion will go to the credit guarantee scheme to, en to enhance access to affordable credit by micro, small, and medium enterprises in the manufacturing sector. And Kenya Shilling 626 million for provision of finances to micro, small, and medium enterprises through the Kenya Industrial Estate. In addition, Mr. Speaker, I have proposed Kenya Shilling 2.6 billion for Dongokundu Special Economic Zone, Kenya Shilling 295 million for the development of the Special Economic Zone, Textile Park in Naivasha, Kenaine Leather Industry Park, and Adi River Textile Hub, Kenya Shilling 50 million for the Freeport and Industrial Park Special Economic Zone in Mombasa. Other proposed allocations include Kenya Shilling 410.4 million for the modernization of river tax and Kenya Shilling 3 billion for supporting access to finance and enterprise recovery. Mr. Speaker, in order to maximize the benefits from our cash crop, the government will, further in, will, will make further investments towards the revival and enhancement of output. In this respect, Mr. Speaker, I propose an allocation of Kenya Shilling 212.1 million for modernization of cooperative cotton engineers and a further Kenya Shilling 250 million for cotton industry revitalization. Mr. Speaker, to equip our youths with essential training and internship opportunities, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 1.3 billion for the Kenya Industrial and Entrepreneurial Entrepreneurship Project. Kenya Shilling 2.1 billion for the Kenya Youth Employment and Opportunities Project. Kenya Shilling 500 million for industrial research la laboratories. Kenya Shilling 200 million for constituency industrial development centers. Mr. Speaker, as part of the Big Four agenda, the government is implementing measures and interventions to achieve food and nutrition security for all Kenyans. These measures include supporting large-scale production of staple food, expanding irrigation schemes, increasing access to agricultural inputs, and supporting smallholder farmers to sustainably produce and market various commodities. To further support programs under this pillar, I propose an allocation of Kenya Shilling for 46.7 billion in this budget. Out of this, Kenya Shilling 4.2 billion will go to the National Agricultural and Rural Inclusivity Project, Kenya Shilling 1.7 billion for the Kenya Cereal Enhancement project, uh, project, Program, Kenya Shilling 1.9 billion has been proposed for the emergency locust response, Kenya Shilling 1.5 billion for the National Value Chain Support Program, Kenya Shilling 1.1 billion for the Agricultural Sector Development Support Program 2, Kenya Shilling 1.5 billion for the Small Scale Irrigation and Value Addition Project, and Kenya Shilling 690 million for Food Security and Crop Diversification Project. Mr. Speaker, the government will further set aside Kenya Shilling 2.7 billion for fertilizer subsidy to cushion farmers during the short range from October to December 2022. This is in addition to the Kenya Shilling 3 billion allocated in the financial 2021-2022. Mr. Speaker, to improve livestock production, I propose Kenya Shilling 500 million for free disease hold, holding ground in Lamu. I also propose Kenya Shilling 1.7 billion for the Kenya Livestock Commercialization Program and Kenya Shilling 121 million for livestock production under B4 initiative. Mr. Speaker, to promote sustainable utilization of the blue econ economy resources, I have proposed an allocation of 1.9 billion for the aquaculture business development project. 
10 shillings 2.8 billion for Kenya marine fisheries and socioeconomic development projects, 10 shillings 1.3 billion for exploitation of living resources under the blue economy, 10 shillings 1 billion for construction of fish processing plant in Lamu, 10 shillings 270 million for cost of fisheries infrastructure development, 10 shillings 210 million for rehabilitation of fish landing sites in Lake Victoria, 10 shillings 204 million for aquaculture technology development and innovation transfers, and Kenya shilling 126.3 million for the development of the Blue Economy Initiative. Mr. Speaker, in order, in order to increase ag agricultural production and enhance resilience to climate change risk in targeted smallholder farming and pastoral communities in Kenya, I have set aside Kenya shilling 147 million for the Climate Smart Agricultural Productivity Project, Kenya shilling 850 million to enhance drought resilience and sustainable livelihood, Kenya shilling 178 million towards ending drought emergencies in Kenya. And in addition, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya shilling 421 million for the livestock and crop insurance scheme to reduce the vulnerabilities of Kenyan farmers to diseases and natural disasters. Mr. Speaker, to ensure legitimacy of land ownership, I have recommended Kenya shilling 1.1 billion for processing and registration of title deeds. Kenya shilling 769 million for digitization of land registries, and Kenya shilling 130 million for construction of land registries. Mr. Speaker, other proposed allocations include Kenya shilling 90 million for revitalization of cotton industry, Kenya shilling 300 million for mitigation of four army worms, Kenya shilling 200 million for establishment of liquid nitrogen plant, Kenya shilling 200 million towards the Embro transfer project and Kenya Shilling 250 million for construction and refurbishment of the Leather Science, Leather Science Institute. Mr. Speaker, having highlighted expenditures under the Economic Stimulus Program and the Big Four Agenda initiatives, I now turn to other proposed areas of expenditure in this budget that will, that will support our path to sustainable and resilient economic recovery. Mr. Speaker, the government continues expanding critical infrastructure in roads, rails, air, and seaports to create an enabling environment for economic recovery and employment creation. Towards this, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya shilling 212.5 billion to, to support construction of roads and bridges, as well as their rehabilitation and maintenance. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the standard gauge railway has presented a modern and efficient transport system that is safe, comfortable, and affordable for passengers and freights to expand railway transport to the rest of the country. I have proposed Kenya Shilling 18.5 billion for development of the standard gauge railway, Kenya Shilling 1.1 billion for railways met metro lines, Kenya Shilling 439 million for rehabilitation of locomotive, and Kenya Shilling 264 million for development of ERP system for SGR. Mr. Speaker, to support production and rela of reliable and affordable energy, I propose a total of Kenya Shilling 91.5 billion, excluding the provision set aside under the Big Four Agenda Initiative. Out of this, Kenya Shilling 62.9 billion will cater for transmission and distribution of power, Kenya Shilling 18.5 billion for development of geothermal energy, Kenya Shilling 9.3 billion for electrification of public facilities, and Kenya Shilling 2 billion for development of nuclear energy as well as exploration and mining of coal. Mr. Speaker, the security of our nation remains paramount and must be maintained to safeguard the considerable development gains. For this reason, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 317.8 billion to support operations of the National Police Service, Defense, and the National Intelligence Services. Mr. Speaker, the proposed allocations include Kenya Shilling 128.4 billion for defense, Kenya Shilling 46.4 billion for the National Intelligence Service, and Kenya Shilling 122.2 billion for police and prison service, Kenya Shilling 10.7 billion for leasing of police motor vehicles, and Kenya Shilling 1 billion for police modernization program, Kenya Shilling 1 billion for the National Communication and Surveillance System, and Kenya Shilling 335 million for the equipment of the National Forensic Laboratory. Mr. Speaker, other proposed allocations include Kenya Shilling 4.8 
billion for medical insurance for the National Police Service and Prisons, Kenya Shilling 2.3 billion for the group personal insurance for the National Police Service and Prisons, as well as Kenya Shilling 1 billion for the National Integrated Identity Management System. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to provide access to quality education for our children and youth. This will indeed facilitate realization of their full potential and enable them effectively contribute to the development of the country. The allocation and efficiency in spending on education has been increased to improve outcomes. As a result, access to education at all levels has improved remarkably as evidenced by the increased enrollment in the basic and tertiary institutions. To further improve education outcomes, I propose a total of Kenya shilling 544.4 billion to support programs in the education sector. Mr. Speaker, out of the proposed allocation, Kenya shilling 12 billion will cater for free primary education, Kenya shilling 2.5 billion for recruitment of teachers, Kenya shilling 64.4 billion for free day secondary school ed education, including insurance under the NHI for secondary school students. Kenya shilling 5 billion for examination fees waiver for grade 6, class 8, and form 4 candidates. And Kenya shilling 1.96 billion for the, special, uh, for the school feeding program. In addition, Mr. Speaker, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya shilling 1.2 billion for training of teachers on competency based curriculum and Kenya shilling 310 million for the digital literacy program and ICT integration in our secondary schools. Mr. Speaker, to support transition from primary education to junior secondary school education under the competency-based curriculum, Kenya Shilling 4 billion has been set aside for the construction of classrooms to support school infrastructure development and ensure safe learning in our schools. I have proposed allocation of 2.8 billion for free, I mean for primary and secondary schools infrastructure and Kenya Shilling 1.8 billion for construction and equipping of technical training institutes and vocational training centers. Further, Kenya Shilling 1.1 billion has been set aside for, to increase access and improve the quality of technical and vocational education and training programs under the East African uh, Skill Transformation and Regional Integration Project. Mr. Speaker, other proposed allocation in the education sector includes Kenya Shilling 294.7 billion to Teachers Service Commission, Kenya Shilling 91.2 billion for university education, Kenya Shilling 15.8 billion to the Higher Education Loans Board, Kenya Shilling 6.8 billion for Kenya Secondary School Education Quality Improvement Project, and Kenya Shilling 5.2 billion cap capitation for Tibet students. Further, Kenya Shilling 527 million has been set aside for technical vocational education training and entrepreneurship. Kenya Shilling 971 million for promotion of youth employment and vocational training, and Kenya Shilling 323 million for the National Research Fund. Mr. Speaker, unleashing the productive potential of people living in poverty involves the re removal of constraints through economic inclusion programs. In this respect, the government continues to support vulnerable groups through the social safety net program. Uh, famously referred to as Inua Jamin. To continue protecting this vulnerable segment, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 39.5 billion for social protection and affirmative actions in this budget. Mr. Speaker, out of this allocation, Kenya Shilling 17.5 billion will cater for cash transfers to elderly persons, Kenya Shilling 7.9 billion for orphans and vulnerable children, and Kenya Shilling 1.2 billion for persons living with severe disabilities. Mr. Speaker, the proposed allocation also includes Kenya Shilling 5.1 billion for the Kenya Hunger Safety Net Program, Kenya Shilling 500 million for the National Drought Emergency Fund, Kenya Shilling 2.6 billion for the Kenya Development Response to Displacement Impact Project, and Kenya Shilling 2.8 billion for the Kenya Social and Economic Inclusion Project. In addition, Kenya Shilling 933.8 million will go to the Child Welfare Society of Kenya and Kenya Shilling 400 million for the Presidential Bursary for the Orphans, and Kenya Shilling 459 million for the National Development Fund for Persons Living with Disabilities. Mr. Speaker, we acknowledge and support the critical role that youth and women play in nation building. 
the need for full and equal, equal participation of youth and women across all spheres of the economy needs to be accelerated and sustained. To further empower the youth and support business owned by the youth, women and persons living with disabilities, I have recommended Kenya Shilling 13.1 billion for the National Youth Service, Kenya Shilling 2.2 billion for the Kenya Youth Empowerment and Opportunities Project, Kenya Shilling 175 million for the Youth Enterprise Fund, Development Fund, Kenya Shilling 170 million for the Women Enterprise Fund, and Kenya Shilling 92 million for the Youth Empowerment and Enterprise Fund. Mr. Speaker, to promote regional equity, reduce poverty, and enhance social development, I have proposed Kenya Shilling 44.3 billion for the National Government Constituency Development Fund, Kenya Shilling 2.1 billion for the National Government Affirmative Action Fund, as well as Kenya Shilling 7.1 billion for the Equalization Fund to finance programs in the previously marginalized areas. Mr. Speaker, we recognize the great opportunities that digital technologies offer in various sectors of the economy. Efficiently deployed, digital technologies have strong potential to accelerate economic recovery and improve livelihoods at relatively low cost for sustainable and inclusive development. For this reason, we have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 15.6 billion to fund initiatives in the information, communication, and technology sector. Specifically, this allocation includes Kenya Shilling 6, 620 million for government shared services. Mr. Speaker, the government is investing in the development of the Kwanzaa National Data Center and Smart City Facilities. This National Data Center was commissioned in July 2021 and is currently hosting client services, including government agencies, and is a platform for the acceleration of innovation, particularly among the youth in Kenya. We encourage all MDAs to take advantage of this modern facility. Mr. Speaker, to fast track the development of the Kwanzaa Techno Technopolis City, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 5.2 billion for the horizontal infrastructure phase one, and Kenya Shilling 3.8 billion for Kwanzaa data center and smart city facilities. Mr. Speaker, other proposed allocations include Kenya Shilling 2.7 billion for maintenance and rehabilitation of last mile connectivity network, Kenya Shilling 1.2 billion for maintenance and rehabilitation of the national optic fiber backbone phase two expansion cable, and Kenya Shilling 1.4 billion for installation and commissioning of Eldoret and Adapal fiber optic cable. Mr. Speaker, to further support, support, support as, as post development and tourism recovery, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 15.8 billion for the Sports, Arts and Social Development Fund, Kenya Shilling 3.2 billion for the Tourism Fund, Kenya Shilling 1.8 billion for Tourism Promotion Fund, and Kenya Shilling 125 million for refurbishment of the regional stadium. Mr. Speaker, Environment, environmental protection and access to adequate supply of clean water is fundamental for the achievement of the socioeconomic development envisioned by the Kenya Vision 2030. To expand access to clean and adequate water for domestic and agricultural use, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 45.9 billion for water and sewerage infrastructure development, Kenya Shilling 16 billion for water resource management, and Kenya Shilling 9.8 billion for water storage and flood control. In addition, I have set aside Kenya Shilling 8.5 billion for irrigation and land reclamation, and Kenya Shilling 2.1 billion for water harvesting and storage for irrigation. Mr. Speaker, in order to support environment and water conservation, I propose to set aside Kenya Shilling 10.2 billion for forest and water towers conservation, Kenya Shilling 3.1 billion for environment management and protection, Kenya Shilling 1.5 billion for meteorological services, and Kenya Shilling 7 billion for wildlife conservation and management. Mr. Speaker, stronger institutions and effective policy implementation and management of resources improve service delivery, transparency, and accountability. We shall continue to seek better public service delivery by building and sustaining strong, efficient, and accountable institutions in order to enhance good governance and scale up our fight against corruption, I propose an allocation of Kenya Shilling 3.6 billion for the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, Kenya Shilling 3.4 billion for the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, 
10 shilling 8.4 billion for the criminal investigation department services and 10 shilling 6.4 billion for the office of the auditor general additionally mr speaker to enhance the oversight and legislative role of parliament and access to justice i propose an allocation of 10 shilling 50.2 billion to parliament and 10 shilling 18.9 billion to the judiciary mr speaker in order to facilitate the 2022 general election we allocated Kenya shilling 2020, uh, allocated Kenya shilling 22.9 billion in the current financial year 2021-2022 and i further propose an allocation of Kenya shilling 21.7 billion in the financial year 2022-2023 to the independent electoral and boundaries commission mr speaker the county governments will receive a, pro a proposed allocation of Kenya shilling 370 billion as equitable share in the financial 2022-2023. This represents 27.3% of the most recent audited and approved revenue raised nationally. Mr. Speaker, in addition to the equitable share of revenue raised nationally, the county governments will receive recommended conditional allocations amounting to Kenya shilling at 7.1 billion bringing the total allocation of the county governments in the financial 2022-2023 to Kenya shilling 407 billion. Mr. Speaker, we, also, we have also complied with the High Court ruling on conditional grants to county governments. In this regard, conditional grants had, have now been excluded from the Division of Revenue Bill 2022, unlike in the case of last, year, last financial year. I note with appreciation that this House has unlocked the settlement on the county government uh, grant bills. This bill will provide a legal framework for transferring conditional grants to the county government, transfer of functions between uh, national county government. Mr. Speaker, in order to ensure that the process of transfer of functions between the national county government is clearly provided for in, in law, we are developing a legislation to operationalize Article 187 and 189 of the Constitution on Transfer of Functions and cooperation between the national and, and the county government. The proposed legislative framework will provide transparency in the administration of intergovernmental transfers in respect of transfer functions and cooperation between government. Once completed, the legislative proposal will be submitted to this Honorable House for consideration and approval. Mr. Speaker, in order to support county government efforts to enhance their own source revenue. The National Treasury has submitted the, national, uh, the county government bill, revenue raising process a bill to this August House. The bill will regulate the manner in which counties introduce or vary fees and charges. Once passed, this legislation will address the problem of multiplicity of fees and charges within, the, within and across counties in line with Article 2000, uh, 209 subsection 5 of the Constitution. I call upon honorable members to consider and approve this bill in a bid to create a conducive environment for business and deal with the issue of multiplicity of fees and charges within the county government. Mr. Speaker, in order to support an implementation of the county government's own source revenue policy, the National Treasury is in collaboration with the Ministry of Land and Fiscal Planning, County Count Council of Governors, and other stakeholders have developed the National Rating Bill 2022 to replace the outdated valuation for Rating Act, CAP 266 and CAP 267. This bill was submitted to this parliament in January 2022, and once enacted will guide valuation for rating and imposition of rates on uh, rateable property. Mr. Speaker, Kenya is a wealth of mineral deposit from the financial year 2016-17 and 2019-20, the government collected a total of Kenya shilling 5.5 billion in royalties from extractive activities. This amount translates to an average of Kenya shilling 1.4 billion annually. Although mineral royalties are currently being received from 15 counties, 91% of the payments are derived from extractive activities in only three counties, namely Kilifi, Kwale, and Kajado. Mr. Speaker, following a presidential directive, the National Treasury has since developed a draft framework which provides for mechanisms for sharing of revenue from mineral royalties among the national government, county governments, and communities in line with Section 183 of the Mining Act, 
2016. The framework, which is currently being subjected to the stakeholder consultation, will provide basis for ensuring that revenues raised from the mineral royalties trickle down to the county governments and communities where mining is taking place. Mr. Speaker, in line with Article 204, Subsection 1 of the Constitution of Kenya, county governments have been allocated. Constitution of Kenya, county governments have been allocated Kenya shilling 7.1 billion and a equalization fund in the financial year 2022-23, which represents 0.55 percent of the most recent audited account or revenue uh, received. Mr. Speaker. Following the High Court ruling on the petition number 272 of 2016 of 5th November 2019, uh, quashing the guidelines of administration of equalization fund and ensuring, uh, ensuing disbandment of the fund's advisory board, all expenditures of the fund were stopped. To mitigate this, Mr. Speaker, the National Treasury in collaboration with other stakeholders developed the PFM uh, regulations 2021, which was approved by Parliament in October 2021. Mr. Speaker, following the appointment of the advisory board and establishment of the secretary, it is expected that com completion of projects as identified under the first policy and the implementation of the programs in the second and subsequent policies will now be fast tracked. Mr. Speaker, continued delays in payment of pending bills to entities that provide goods and services to both national and county governments have affected liquidity and operation of these entities. In a number of cases, this has led to closure of businesses affecting livelihoods of the suppliers. Though some progress was noted in the settlement of these pending bills by the national county government, we still have challenges where a number of suppliers are owed large amounts of money. In this regard, I direct count, uh, government ministries, departments and agencies as well as the county governments to clear all their pending bills by 30th June uh, 2022. In addition, we call upon all the MDAs and county governments to avoid accumulation of pending bills and ensure that payments are made as and when due. Mr. Speaker, I now want to highlight the tax policy measures for the financial 2022-23 budget, which are contained in the finance bill 2022. I will also highlight custom measures that Kenya will be presenting for consideration by the East African Community Ministers responsible for finance and economic affairs in the pre-budget consultation plan for May uh, this year. These custom measures will become effective from 1st July 2022. Mr. Speaker, the proposed measures contained in the Finance Bill 2022 are expected to generate an additional Kenya 50.4 billion to the Exchequer for the financial 2022-2023 budget. Mr. Speaker, as I indicated in this statement, we consulted other partner states in the South African community, and Kenya was allowed to present its budget statement earlier than the other partner states. With regards to customs measures, we have evaluated various proposals that we intend to submit for consideration during the South African community pre-budget consultation by the EAC Ministers for Finance, which will be held later in May this year. The measures that will be agreed upon will be communicated through the EAC Gazette and implemented from 1st July uh, this year. Mr. Speaker, these measures are generally meant to promote our manufacturing sector and enhance our exports by making input and raw materials used in the manufacture of goods <coughs> more affordable hence lowering the cost of production. In addition, some of the measures are aimed at enhancing the competitiveness of locally manufactured goods <coughs> through protection from unfair competition by imported goods. <coughs> some of the custom measures are also geared towards protecting of critical sectors of our economy, like agriculture, from unfair competition occasioned by importation of products that can be produced by our gallant farmers. In cases where local production does not meet our demand, the government will ensure the deficit is met in an orderly manner that does not 
adversely affect our farmers. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the proposed amendments under the Value Added Tax Act. The outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing socioeconomic implications on Kenyans continue to impose a heavy burden on our health sector. In this regard, I have proposed more incentives to the sector by exempting from VAT plant and machinery for use by manufacturers of pharmaceutical products. Mr. Speaker, the government has been progressively addressing the cost of health care in the country so as to expand access to quality and affordable health care services. To further reduce the health care costs, I propose to exempt from VAT medical oxygen supply to registered hospitals, urine bags, adult diapers, artificial breasts, and colostomy or elastomy bags for medical use. Mr. Speaker, assembly of motor vehicles and manufacture of motor vehicle parts locally has gained traction. In order to encourage more investment, especially in the manufacture of passenger motor vehicles locally, I propose to exempt from VAT inputs and raw materials used in the manufacture of passenger motor vehicles. Additionally, I propose to exempt lo locally manufactured passenger motor vehicles from VAT. Mr. Speaker, charitable organizations play an important role of supporting the vulnerable members of the society. Currently, entities that make cash donations to charitable organizations that are registered under either the Societies Act or the Non-Governmental Organization Coordination Act are allowed to deduct the cash donations from their taxable income. However, entities that donate cash to charitable organizations that are not registered under the two acts are not allowed to deduct such donations from their taxable income. To address this challenge, I propose to amend the Income Tax Act to allow all entities that donate cash to charitable organizations to deduct the donations from their taxable income. Mr. Speaker, Kenya has witnessed significant growth in the use of financial directives, uh, directives including aging, features, and options. However, there is no provision in the Income Tax Act to, to charge the gains accruing from the financial directives to non-residents. Non to ensure equity and fairness, I propose to amend the Income Tax Act to provide for the taxation of, gain, taxation of gains accruing to the non-residents for the transaction involving financial directives in Kenya. Mr. Speaker, last year, the Income Tax Act was amended to replace the previously thin capitation rule for determining taxable income with a method that restricts interest based on a ratio of earning before interest, taxes, depreciation, and harmonization. In the amendment, microfinance institutions licensed under the Microfinance Act were omitted in the exclusion list of the application for the new rule. In this regard, I propose to amend the Income Tax Act to exclude microfinance institutions licensed under the Microfinance Act from the interest restrictions based on a ratio of earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization in determination of their taxable income. Mr. Speaker, next I will highlight the proposed amendments under the Excise uh, Duty Act. The Act provides for annual inflation adjustments of the specific duty rates on all uh, products. However, it has been observed that the adjustment may not all always be appropriate for some products, depending on the economic and social environment facing these products at that time. To address this, I propose to empower the Commissioner General of KRA to exclude from inflation adjustment such products after consideration of the prevailing economic circumstances facing, facing them. Mr. Speaker, last year, the Excise Duty Act was amended to introduce excess duty on all imported eggs. This was meant to protect local uh, producers of eggs, eggs. However, we have noted that the tax has adversely affected the hatching business as this is sufficient local capacity to supply all the required eggs for hatching. To address this situation, I propose the exempt from excise duty eggs from hatching imported by licensed hatcheries upon recommendation by the responsible cabinet secretary. Mr. Speaker, neutral spirit is an input for manufacture of pharmaceutical products. Manufacturers of pharmaceutical products, which are not subject to excise uh, duty, are entitled to a refund of the excise duty paid on the raw materials or inputs. The processing of such refunds takes time. 
is creating cash flow challenges. To address this concern, I propose to exempt neutral spirit used by the registered pharmaceutical manufacturers upon approval of the Commissioner General of, of KRA from excise duty. Mr. Speaker, currently, locally assembled motor vehicles are exempt from excise duty. In order to ensure the same treatment for manufactured passenger motor vehicles, I propose to exempt from excise duty locally manufactured passenger motor vehicles. This is aimed at encouraging investment in this sector and enhancing competitiveness of locally manufactured passenger motor vehicles. Mr. Speaker, gambling, gaming, and alcohol addiction have become prevalent in our society. These habits are extremely addictive and can result in a variety of harmful repercussions, especially to the youth. Advertisements for alcoholic beverages, betting, and gaming contribute greatly to the promotion of this habit. To discourage the promotion of these products and activities, I propose to introduce exercise duty of 15% on fees charged by all television stations, print media, billboards, and radio stations for advertisements of these activities. Mr. Speaker, in the recent years, innovations in the tobacco industry have led to the introduction of new products beyond e-cigarettes. E these products continue to negatively affect the health of our citizens. The design of these products and the taxation regime makes them easily accessible to users, including the school children and the youth, thus leading to nicotine addiction and consequently uh, smoking and use of other drugs. In order to prevent this habit and make the liquid nicotine used in these devices less accessible to users, including the school children and the youth, I propose to ch charge to change the taxation regime for liquid nicotine from current shilling per unit to an excess duty of 10 shillings 70 per milliliter. Mr. Speaker, in the bill, I have also proposed to increase the specific rates of excess duty for a number of products by 10% to generate additional revenue for the government. Given the recent global increase in oil prices, I have excluded petroleum products from this increase. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the proposed amendments under the Miscellaneous Fees and Levies Act. In order to promote manufacturing of pharmaceutical products, I propose to exempt inputs and raw materials imported by manufacturers of pharmaceutical products from payment of import declaration fees and railway development levy. This will encourage investments in the health sector and improve access to affordable health care services. Mr. Speaker, in order to support farmers who rear cows as well as pastoralist communities who depend on sale of hides and skin, I propose to reduce the export levy on the raw hides and skin from 80% or uh, US dollars, 0 0.5 per kilogram, to 50 cents or US dollars, uh, 0.32 per kilogram. Mr. Speaker, on the amendments to, to enhance tax administration procedures, Government agencies are expected to be sensitive and responsive to emerging customer needs. In this respect, the Kenya Revenue Authority has been on a journey of transformation to enhance customer-centric service delivery. In order to align the operation of the authorities with emerging trends, I propose to amend the Kenya Revenue Authority Act to change the name of the authority from Kenya Revenue Authority to Kenya Revenue Service. The change of the name is intended to rebrand the authority and transform its public image, thus enhance tax compliance through improved public relations and maintain a clear focus on taxpayers' needs. I have also proposed consequential amendments to other statutes which make reference to the name Kenya Revenue Authority and align them to the proposed new name. Mr. Speaker, we have noted that tax disputes take too long to conclude especially after judgment by the Tax Appeals Tribunal. In order to protect the disputed tax revenue, I propose to amend the Tax Appeals Tribunal Act 2013 to require a deposit of 50% of the disputed uh, tax revenue in a special account at the Central Bank of Kenya when the Tribunal makes a ruling in favor of the Commissioner General of KRA as the taxpayer proceeds to appeal the decision. I have also proposed that in case of the taxpayer in case the taxpayer receives judgment in his or her favor on final determination of the matter, the 50% deposit 
shall be refunded to the taxpayer within 30 days of the final determination of the matter by the courts. Mr. Speaker, the Tax Procedure Act empowers the Commissioner General KRA to issue directions to the land registrar, registrar to put a caveat on land or restriction on the transaction for taxpayers with tax arrears. It is noted that the taxpayer may have other assets other than land which the Commissioner can put caveat or restriction on transfer to secure and paid tax revenue. In this respect, I propose to amend the Tax Procedure Act to require registrars of ships, aircrafts, motor vehicles, and any other properties that may be used as security for unpaid taxes to restrict the disposal or transaction of these assets upon receipt of direction from the Commissioner. Mr. Speaker, the Tax Procedures Act empowers the Commissioner General KRA to request for additional information from the taxpayers in order to facilitate determination of an objection on assessment tax. The Act does not specify the number of times that the Commissioner can request for such information on a particular case. This prolongs the determination of tax disputes as additional information can be requested severally and any request for additional information provides the Commissioner with additional 60 days to make a decision. In order to address this gap, I propose to amend the Act to require the Commissioner to issue a decision on objection by taxpayer within one cycle of 60 days from the date of receiving a valid objection by a taxpayer. Mr. Speaker, Kenya ratified and deposited the Multilateral Convention for Mutually Administrative Service Assistance in the Tax Matter with the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information on Tax Matters in July 2020. Under this convention, Kenya is expected to exchange information on tax matters with tax jurisdictions that are members of the forum. In order to promote greater tax transparency among multinational enterprises, I propose to amend the Income Tax Act to require that multilateral enterprises which have been operational in Kenya to report the activities within Kenya and in other jurisdictions to the Commissioner General Kenya Revenue Authority. Mr. Speaker, the Statutory Instrument Act that became effective in 2013 provides for automatic expiry of the statutory instrument after 10 years from the date of their publication. In this respect, there are several tax-related re regulations issued in accordance with the Act as well as some that were issued prior to the enactment of the Act that will expire after the 10-year period. The expiry of these instruments will negatively affect tax administration and revenue collection. In this regard, I propose to amend the Statutory Instrument Act to exempt the tax-related regulations under the various tax laws from automatic expiry provided under the, under the Act. Mr. Speaker, this administration has implemented socioeconomic transformative programs and a devolved system of government that required enormous financial resources. At the same time, the country was confronted by some degree of security challenges, the twin global challenges of COVID-19 pandemic and climate change, and the desert locust invasion that impacted on food security. In the midst of all this, Mr. Speaker, the government has successfully maintained microeconomic stability, achieved growth, growth rates above that of sub-Saharan African region, and improved welfare of Kenyans. In conclusion, therefore, Mr. Speaker, our sustained investments since 2013 have significantly transformed our economy and strengthened our resilience. Encouraged by this, our economy has bounced back, giving our people incredible optimism, even in the situation of extreme challenges. Mr. Speaker, we are proud of our socioeconomic achievements and seek to sustain high economic growth so as to improve the welfare of our people. Considering the envisaged development agenda and the limited fiscal space, we have carefully balanced the difficult choices in resource allocation in order to finance the highest priorities that will propel this country to a greater heights of prosperity. I am confident that we have made the right decisions that will accelerate the pace of our economic growth. At this point, Mr. Speaker, I wish to thank His Excellency the President, Honorable Uru Kenyatta, for his leadership and guidance, which has transformed this country into a regional economic hub. I also thank I also thank my fellow cabinet secretaries, the principal, respective principal secretaries, and various accounting officers and staff in all government ministries 
departments and agencies for their support and contribution to the financial year 2022-2023 budget. Mr. Speaker, I also express gratitude to Kenyans for their rich and diverse contributions, proposals and suggestions that help us to finalize this budget. My appreciation goes to uh, first to you, Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, and your counterpart in Senate, the majority and minority leaders, and the entire House leadership, including the respective clerks, for overseeing the approval process of the budget estimates for the financial 2022-2023 and the related document. Second, to the honorable members of the Budget and Appropriation Committee, the Finance and Budget Planning Committee, and all other departmental committees of this House, as, as, as well as the staff of Parliamentary Budget Office, for their constructive inputs during the approval process of the budget. Third, I recognize and appreciate the management and staff of the National Treasury who have worked tirelessly for long hours to ensure that these budget and supporting documents were prepared within new timelines to enable the presentation of this budget in April, thus paving way for the, general, for the August general election. Fourth, the Kenya Revenue Authority, Central Bank of Kenya, Attorney General's Office, Commission on Revenue Allocation, Financial Sector Regulators, and the various agencies under the National Treasury and their planning for their contribution and advice during the budget process. Fifth, my gratitude goes to our multilateral and bilateral development partners for their continued technical and financial support. Further, I thank the private sector for their sustained contribution to the growth of our economy. And sixth, I wish to appreciate the media and the non-state actors for their active engagement and participation in the financial 2022-2023 budget process. Mr. Speaker, Allow me to once again thank all, all honorable members of the National Assembly and the Senate for their support in facilitating a legislative proposal supporting the government economic transformation agenda over the last 10 years. At this juncture, I wish honorable members the very best as they seek to renew their mandates with the electorates during the upcoming general election. My hope is that the election period will not distract us from the, our pursuit to solidify and sustain the economic growth trajectory we have realized over the years. Lastly, I note uh, list. Mr. Speaker, I remain immensely grateful to my family for their love, understanding, regular encouragement, and above all, their unfailing support as I stay at my demanding duties at the National Treasury and planning since my appointment to the doctor. I thank you all, and may God bless you. The very last, Mr. Mr. Speaker, before I resume my seat, you recall that I've already submitted this House the budget estimates and the finance bill 2022, together with accompanying documents as required by the Public Finance Management Act 2012. Today, I further submit the following documents to this August House and request that you graciously uh, gracefully receive them. Honorable Speaker, this, the documents include the budget statement of the financial year 2022-2023, the budget policy statement 2022, estimates of revenue, grants, and loans for the financial year 2022-2023 budget, financial statement for the uh, for the finance uh, for the for the year 2022-2023 budget, medium-term debt management strategy 2022, sixth budget highlights, the Monenchi guide for the financial year 2022-2023, and lastly, the statistical annex to the budget statement for the financial year 2022-2023. Thank you, Honorable Speaker.
now, members, uh, that concludes uh, the session by the Cabinet Secretary for National Treasury on the presentation of the budget highlights for the financial year 2022-2023. Now, members, time being 4.57 p.m. It's uh, now time for the House to rise. The House stands adjourned till Tuesday, the 12th of February at 2.30 p.m. Honourable members, the rise of the House, members are invited for a cup of tea, including our guests and the members, uh, ministers, parking lots. You have been watching a special broadcast of the National Assembly Proceedings where the Cabinet Secretary for National Treasury and Planning, Ambassador Okuri Atani, has been making a public pronouncement of the budget highlights and revenue raising measures for the national government for the financial year 2022-2023. This broadcast has been brought to you by the Parliamentary Broadcasting Unit in conjunction with the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. On behalf of the team, my name is Edward Kabasa. Good evening.